So, now David Schiem, welcome here at the University of Zurich. It's very good that you are here, and I give you now the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, before we speak about Messiah mode, first we have to understand the political context that we're talking about, a little introduction to Jewish political thought in our times. So, I'm going to appropriate or reappropriate this tradition we have. I don't know if any of you recognize this. These are uh, images from the Passover Haggadah. This is the story that we tell on the Passover holiday. We say there's four types of Jews, and we've done this for hundreds of years, and so I'm going to appropriate this and say, yes, there are four types of Jewish political thought. Um, I would say that there are reformist, opportunist, supremacist, and humanist. And that these four, uh, four political ideas, they, they make an acronym, Rosh, or head in Hebrew, so that's an easy way to remember it. But what do I mean by this? Well, each of these political streams uh, can be understood in the way that it relates to the Jewish texts, the Jewish uh, religious books like the Torah and the Talmud. The question that you would ask is, is the Torah holy? And is the Torah just? Right. So coming into modern era, right, the vast majority of Jewish folks are living in the context of Orthodox Jewry, and Orthodox Judaism, and so I term that political camp supremacist camp, and they answer to these questions, yes and yes. Yes, the Torah is holy. Yes, the Torah was written by God, and it is you know, sacred as such, and yes, it is just. When it says in the Torah that you know, uh, the Jewish people are the God's chosen people and that God is our real estate agent who gave the land of, of this Israel-Palestine to the Jewish people, that is just, that's correct. So, of course, once we have um, the Enlightenment and we have Christian countries in the European context you know, emancipating its population, and now there's an option to be secular, and there's an explosion or a big bang of Jewish political options for the first time. And so we start to see these other camps. There's the reformist camp, and their answers to these questions are different. They say, yes, the Torah is holy. Yes, this is our spiritual tradition, and we value it as sacred, but no, it's not just. It's not right. We need to tinker with it and adapt it and adjust it and amend it to be in line with our modern ethics and values. So that's the reformist movement. The next movement to, uh, to emerge at this time is what we would consider, I call it the opportunist camp. That's like the modern Zionist position. And they have the opposite. They say, no, of course the Torah is not holy. It was written by men and then edited by other men you know, over various uh, eras and you know, it's literature, it's our traditional literature, but it's not the word of God. And, but yes, it is right that it says that this land belongs to us. So in brief, no, there is no God, but yes, God gave us the land of Israel. That's the Zionist opportunist position. And then, of course, there is also uh, what was 100 years ago, perhaps the, the largest of these camps, the socialist camp, I call it the humanist camp, and they would answer to these questions, no and no. No, the Torah is not holy, uh, it's just literature, and no, it's not right that we are chosen, that we are any more important than any other people, and so that doesn't reflect our values. Now, of course, when I you know, lay out these four political camps, I can already imagine some folks here might be saying, come on, David, Get real. I mean, it's so obvious. You're making it so obvious. These are so biased. The terms you use, supremacist, you know, uh, humanist, it's very clear what you're thinking and feeling. And, and okay, legitimate. I'm not trying to pretend I'm something, anything else, you know. This is what I'm thinking. These are my views. Uh, I firmly, you know, place myself in that camp, in the humanist camp. But I would argue that no matter what camp you're from, you would still see the same four camp schema. So let's say, you, you, know, you would still see yourself as the most noble, but you would still recognize it. So let's say you're from the, uh, the reformist camp. So you'd say, ah, we are the stable ones. We provide stability to the system, right? Uh, 
those Zionists, they're hawkish, you know. Uh, the religious, they're old school, and the socialists, they're too far left. But you'd still recognize it. Same if you were a Zionist. You'd say, ah, yes, we are the heroic ones, right? The reformists, they're spineless. The religious, they're useful. They help us implement our plan to acquire more territory. And, the, of course, the leftists, they're traitorous. Same if you were in the uh, religious camp. You'd say, ah, we are the intelligent ones, right? And so on and so forth. So you would see yourself in the best terms, but... Regardless, you would still understand or perceive the same four-camp schema. That's what I'd argue. So, again, perhaps if you'd like, we can you know, deplete these of their valence, of their, of their you know, political orientation. We can say, okay, liberal, nationalist, religious, socialist. Those are the four camps, and those are unbiased terms we can use, but you know, it doesn't make a really handy acronym that's easy to remember. And of course, I'm making the presentation, so I'm going to use my own uh, four-camp Roche schema. This is the terms, these are the terms I'm going to use for the rest of the presentation. But the idea is just to give you a grounding upon which we can build, upon which we can start to understand, start to interpret um, Jewish political thought, and more specifically, the Israeli uh, political reality that we're living in. Okay, that's just the introduction. Now, let's move on. We're looking at the Knesset, Israel's parliament. And as you can see, the vast majority of seats are controlled by the nationalist camp, right? The opportunists. And the second largest camp, the red camp, they are the supremacists or the orthodox, the religious camp. So, of course, this isn't just a, a one-off. This isn't just like a, only in this political moment. This is something that has existed for a long time, at least as long as I've been tabulating the official results of the government you can see election after election after election since the start of the millennium. Every time, it turns out, the largest camp is the nationalist camp, and the second largest camp is the religious camp. So what does that mean? What does it look like and feel like to live in a country in which the nationalists rule are in the driver's seat and the religious are in the shotgun position? So for us, what it feels like is Netanyahu consistently prime minister for the last decade. And, but every few years, he cycles through a different education minister. And every time that education minister is religious, and each one more religious than the last, and implementing their vision of what they want to see, what, they want, what values they want to imbue into, uh, into the school system so that the youth will grow up with, with these values. Now, here's just a slice to give you a sense of what I mean by that, of what this feels like. So, Bnei David, this is the, uh, the most important, perhaps, uh, educational facility. You know, it's like the, uh, the religious seminary that is ha most highest, uh, you know, considered to be the most important in terms of this is an army uh, academy in which army officers are sent to to study, to study the Torah and the Talmud. So in the settlement of Eli at this academy, you have rabbis teaching these lectures, and I'm just going to give you some quotes directly from the Hebrew so you can evaluate what kind of messages are being put forth and passed on. So here's uh, Rabbi Eliezer Kashtiel, and this is what he has to say to his students. Due to the abolition of legal slavery, there are now deficiencies since no one is responsible for the property, right? Humans' property. With the help of God, it will return. Slavery will return. So who are going to be these slaves? Oh, the non-Jews will want to be our slaves, he says. Being the slave of a Jew is the best. They must be slaves. They want to be slaves. Instead of wandering the streets, being foolish and violent, Harming one another, now his life begins. All around us, there are nations with genetic problems. Ask any simple Arab where he wants to be. He wants to be under the occupation. Why? Because they have a genetic problem. They don't know how to run a country. They don't know how to do anything. Look at the state of them. This sounds kind of racist. Uh, yeah, he goes on. He says, yeah, of course racism exists. Are we unaware that there are different races in the world? Is it a secret? Is it untrue? What can you do? It's true. Yes, we're racists. We believe in racism. Correct. There are races in the world, 
and gen nations have genetic attributes. So it requires of us to consider how to help them. Racial differences are real, and this is precisely a reason to offer help. Okay, wow, that's, uh, that's really something. This is the premier you know, military academy um, in the state of Israel. Wow, okay, but maybe this is just one off. You know, maybe this guy's an exception to the rule. Surely this can't be the bulk of what they're teaching, right? Um, okay, so we move on. Here's another rabbi, Giora Redler, and what he teaches, he has a, takes a different tack. What he'll have to say is about the Holocaust. He says, the Holocaust wasn't really about killing the Jews. That's not the Holocaust. Okay, uh, so what is the Holocaust? All those excuses that it was ideological or systematic, that's nonsense. Because it was out of ideology, in a way, it was more moral than if it was just people just murdering, right? Humanism, the whole secular culture of believing in man, that is the Holocaust, he says. The real Holocaust is to be pluralistic, to believe in man. That is called Holocaust. Oh. For many years already, God has been screaming that the diaspora is over, but people don't listen to him. And that is their disease, which must be cured by the Holocaust. Wow. So Jewish people living anywhere in the world other than the state of Israel, that's a disease. And the cure for this disease is to genocide said Jews. Wow. That's you know, about as revisionist as you're going to get. That's, that's pretty sickening stuff. And then he goes on. In relative terms, the logic of the Germans was internally consistent. Hitler said that a group of people, a certain group in the population, is the source of evil for all humanity. They cause evil to humanity, and therefore, they must be exterminated. Okay, so let's start with the question. He says, was Hitler right or not? Seems like a pretty obvious answer, right? But you'd su be surprised. He says, he is the most righteous person possible. Of course, he was right in every word he said. Talking about Adolf Hitler. There is the, and he goes on to explain, right? What does he mean by this? There is the masculine world that wages war, that is concerned with respect. And then there is the soft, moral, feminine world of turning the other cheek. This is how he, he you know, these, these are the intonations that he, he actually uses when he gives it. You can watch it all online, of course. Incidentally, these videos are easily accessible. And it's the Jews that carry on that tradition, trying to ruin all of humanity, and therefore, they are the real enemy. He is on the wrong side, but otherwise he is 100% correct. So, briefly, he's saying Hitler um, is ascribing, is saying you know, that the correct way to be is strong, to believe that might makes right. And if you, in fact, you know, believe in, just, in, in mercy, in being merciful to the other, then that is you know, the most evil thing that humanity can do. Okay, and so Hitler was incorrect in ascribing that feminine, merciful quality to Jews. In fact, it, you know, it wasn't Jews, but that attitude to believe that might makes right and that mercy is, is evil, that's 100% correct, according to Rabbi Giorg Redler at Israel's top military academy. Okay, David, surely, you know, these are just, you know, two exceptions to the rule. This, and there must be more. Unfortunately, these aren't the exceptions. These are the rules. So we'll hear from another rabbi at that academy, Yosef Kellner. And he has a lecture on another topic. He says that to not follow the Torah and commandments is lack of morality and national treason. So if you're a Jewish person and you don't follow all the you know, minutia of rules and regulations written in the Talmud, then you are a traitor to the Jewish people. In fact, it's called genociding a people, he says. That's genocide, to, not be, to be a secular Jew. You are not a national criminal, you are an international criminal. It's called crime against humanity. So now, can a nation protect itself from the traitors within? According to most, traitors are sentenced to a bullet in the head, everywhere. For those who betray them, every sanction is legitimate, up to a bullet in the head. Wow. So, um, slavery, thumbs up, we need to bring it back. The Holocaust, you know, Hitler was 100% correct, the most moral person possible. And if you're a secular Jew, you are sentenced to death, you deserve to die. 
if I'm summing up, summarizing the, the, you know, the ideology of the top military academy in the state of Israel, paid for with my tax money. Now, again, you're going to say, oh, this is some outlier. Surely this academy isn't important. Surely these people are condemned. Come on. This is the headmaster of the academy, Eli Sadan, and here he is a couple years ago receiving the Israel Prize, the highest prize in the country. Okay, receiving it from the education minister at that time. You know, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is there congratulating him. Okay, now I should point out that uh, coming up on the, the April elections that we just held a few months back, um, you know, of course, Everyone running for election wanted to come to this important academy to be able to speak to the students and, you know, kind of uh, get them excited about the idea of voting for them, perhaps. But the headmaster did not allow Bennett, the education minister, and he did not allow Netanyahu, the prime minister, to speak to the students. The only politician he allowed to speak to the students was his favorite politician, and that's this man. Uh, who, you know, previously the chief rabbi of the Israeli army, now Netanyahu just made him the most recent education minister. This is our new education minister, Rafi Peretz. And Rafi Peretz, what does he do now that he's our education minister? Well, if you can imagine this, he gives a prize to, to who? Who does he give a prize to? This man, Yitzhak Ginsburg. Now, I'm going to be bombarding you with names, and I don't expect you to remember almost any of them, because come on, right? But if you're going to remember one name, maybe just this one, because this is probably the most racist rabbi in the country, uh, and, and quite sickening and at that. He, a decade ago, uh, published a book called The King's Torah, or Torah Tamelech. And this book, it's a, like a theological treatise. It asks the question, under what circumstances may a Jew kill a non-Jew? And... He comes to the conclusion that pretty much under any circumstance, he writes there, there is justification for killing babies if it is clear that they will grow up to harm us. So, this is the man who receives a prize from Israel's education minister. Essentially, you know, publishing a Gentile murdering manual. Oh, so what, they didn't report this in the Basler Zeitung? You know, so, I mean, is this not ridiculous that I have to fly all the way over here and burn up all these fossil fuels to explain this to you, this basic stuff? That's a problem, and you need to start asking why that is. But that's for you to figure out. In the meantime, Rafi Peretz, the education minister, uh, coming up on those last elections in April, uh, he voted to merge his party with the party of Mayor Kahana, or the followers of Mayor Kahana. And you know, if I've already given you a long list of you know, horrendous uh, you know, manifestations of racism in Israeli society, um, which are horrific in enough in, in, in and of themselves, but then you know, this step, uh, to me, is a red line, is another uh, beyond the pale moment. And it wouldn't necessarily be obvious to folks in this room who maybe don't have the same grounding in Israeli history. And so, but once it did happen, once uh, Peretz decided to merge his party with the Kahanas party, to legitimize them, to mainstream them, um, to bring them back into the fold and to, uh, to give them a, a step into the next government, I said, okay, we need to understand what this means, how horrific this is, and we need to understand the movement of Mayor Kahana and what he represents and why this is so scary. So the story of Kahana uh, doesn't start in Israel. It starts in the United States many, many decades earlier, and that's what I'm going to take you to now. The rest of the presentation is about the life and times of this man, Mayor Kahana. So Kahana, he grows up the son of a rabbi, and... That means he's you know, part of the supremacist camp, the orthodox camp. But at the same time, every time 
that Zev Jabotinsky, the leader of the revisionist Zionist movement, every time Jabotinsky comes to New York, he stays in the home of the Kahana family. So he's also growing up within that tradition, within the Zionist tradition. Now, you know, so on one hand, he's studying Talmud in religious seminaries. On the other hand, he's getting arrested on the streets of New York City, protesting, uh, in this case, protesting the uh, arrival of the British foreign minister at that time uh, for his Palestine policies. So in any case, what does this mean? You know, I, I would argue that Kahana, growing up in each of these camps, actually fuses the two, combines the two of these, uh, and creates a new camp, in a way, because each of these camps the religious and the nationalist, they're both right-wing camps, but at the same time, each of them has a, uh, like a release valve in a way. So think about it. The nationalists, right, they want to acquire more and more territory, but at the same time, they're secular. So you can still have a, qu a conversation with them on a logical basis, right? That's their release valve. Now, the religious camp, their vision is a totalitarian one. They want to implement a theocracy. There's no place for non-Jews in their vision of what they want the state of Israel to become. But traditionally, the ultra-Orthodox position was that they were pacifists. They wouldn't be activists. They didn't want to physically implement that vision of what they wanted to come to pass. They would say that that's for God to do. That's for God to come down and, and bring that into being. So that's their release valve. Right? So each of these right-wing camps has a release valve, but when Kahana combines the two, then that new camp wants to implement this you know, theocracy by force, you know, by activism. And so I would argue that this new uh, manifestation is, an, is a fifth camp. Uh, I would call it either the monarchist camp or the messianic camp. And I would argue that that camp has, uh, has six points in their platform, and that's what I'm going to now run you through, explain to you the messianic camp that Kahana really was the harbinger of. So first off, start off with Kahana growing up, pretty conventional uh, for a rabbi, getting his ordination and getting married, and then starting career as a rabbi, but at that time, this is late 60s now, so we have the Vietnam War going on in the United States, and of course, that's bringing up a lot of uh, conflict in the culture, people starting to protest that war. It's also no secret that there were uh, no small number of Jewish folks who were also part of that protest movement. And at that time, the American government saw this as a threat. And so, you know, across the board, they were attempting to turn citizens, you know, towards support of the war and against the anti-war movement. And in the Jewish community, they tapped Kahana to do that. So I say the first plank of his platform is anti-leftism. And so this is Kahana back in the day at that time. The uh, U.S. government tapped him to try to foment pro-war position amongst Jewish students. And he actually authored a book, The Jewish Stake in Vietnam. Um, then the next phase... At that same time, you know, also the civil rights era in the U.S., black folks are standing up demanding equal rights and to state-sponsored racism. And, you know, that seems to be like a very powerful movement. And then, boom, Martin Luther King is assassinated in 1968. And then folks start asking themselves, well, you know, all this time, I've been listening to what Martin had to say, and I've been protesting nonviolently, but, you know, if Martin is gunned down in the streets, then is that really a viable option anymore? Is there a point to, maybe we need to ramp up our activism and take it to the next level. So then we see in the late 60s, a after MLK is assassinated, we see some of his um, supporters, people who worked with him, like this man James Foreman, again, ramping it up a notch, and getting radicalized and starting to speak about something that today on the left we you know, would consider a mainstream demand, but then it was considered super radical, talking about reparations for black folks in the United States uh, for you know, centuries of slavery. So James Foreman issues this manifesto calling for you know, a manifesto to the white Christian churches and Jewish synagogues in the US and all other racist institutions. 
And what, is, what does he want? He decides that he's going to make a march on the richest church in New York City. It's the Riverside Church. And he's going to say, pay up. It's time for you guys to come clean and set the record straight. And so he demands of them to pay him $500 million dollars you know, as restitution for slavery and how they benefited from it. So how did they respond? You know, well, 500 million is a lot of money, but they actually stepped up and offered him 500,000 and, and he accepted it. And he's okay. They listened to what he had to say and they felt it was legitimate. So um, they were able to, to come to an agreement. Great. Now that that worked out, he decides a couple weeks later, he's going to do the same thing, but with the richest Jewish synagogue in New York City, Temple Emanuel, Manhattan. And sure enough, you know, announces his intentions to go up there. And um, at least according to the historical record, people in, in the synagogue said that they, were, they stated their willingness to hear him speak and to listen to his arguments. So this is when Kahana implements the second plank of his platform, anti-blackness. And he decides he's going to confront James Foreman. James Foreman, he's not going to allow this to pass. And so he gets together uh, a group of young Jewish men. And according to Time magazine, 30 members arrived at Temple Emanuel with clubs and chains. And Kahana went on the record saying, quote, if he shows up, we'll break both his legs. Why? Well, there is no reason why Jews should give in to this extortion. Extortion, yes. According to Kahana, he said, there were no Jewish slave owners. We owe him nothing. Now, uh, I'm not going to go too deep into this. If you're interested in what actually went down, I urge you to watch my previous lecture, Judea, Africa, America, where I go into great detail about it. But just very briefly, this is the exact opposite of what occurred. According to Bertram Korn and many others, and this is an esteemed rabbi and a chaplain in the U.S. Army and an author of many books, including Jews and Negro Slavery in the Old South, he documented it. And uh, what he said, according to Bertram Korn, quote, any Jew who could afford to own slaves and had need for their services would do so in the American South. So at least from my research, there's no evidence to suggest on one hand that Jews participated more than their Christian neighbors in the slave trade. But at the same time, there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that they participated any less than their Christian neighbors. If they could, they did. So there is a lot to account for. Maybe Kahana's own ancestors had only recently arrived in the U.S. after the Civil War, but uh, the Jewish community of America also had a debt to pay. And of course, Kahana wouldn't hear it. So he you know, launches his anti-black uh, campaign, and what this means in practice is, you know, on the East Coast, they were incensed by the idea of black teachers in the school system, so they protested that. On the, wet, on the West Coast, they actually protested against black students being bussed into the same schools as Jewish youth. So, on one, you know, they, they took the Black Panthers, who, had, you know, in the... In the wake of the assassination of Martin Luther King, we have the black community ramping up its own activism, as I said, and we have uh, militant groups like the Black Panthers patrolling uh, black neighborhoods in New York City and other cities across the United States, starting in Northern California. So, you know, on one hand, Kahana says of the Black Panthers, oh, they're goose-stepping Nazis, you know? But on the other hand, he adopts their whole manners you know, and their whole, plat their whole idea of patrolling the neighborhood, and he, he takes their, their berets, and then he you know, starts these Jewish patrols, where they would patrol neighborhoods of New York City with these same berets. And the idea here was you know, to confront anyone that they felt was a threat to their community. Now, you know, at this point, uh, and when I say confront, I mean with baseball bats and machetes, right? And duped it out in the streets. Now, you know, some people may recall living in the U.S. at that time, and they'll take issue with this, and they'll say, come on, David, is that really fair? Is it fair to put all this on anti-blackness, on anti-black racism? I mean, at that time, not only New York City, but in general, uh, you know, there was a massive amount of urban blight, specifically in New York, but also in other American cities. And if you were a person who was able to, then maybe you would have moved out into the suburbs, white flight, 
you know, where you wouldn't have the, all the problems of the inner city, but that left behind older, elderly Jews and uh, working class Jews who didn't have the same means to move out to the suburbs. And so now you're in a situation where there's lots of street crime. So wasn't Kahana just fighting crime? Wasn't he just defending old and impoverished Jews? How dare you assert that that's because of racism? Okay, I hear that. But if that's true, then why did he make, you know, <laughs> common cause in the Italian community? Because, you know, this is Kahana, arm in arm with Joe Colombo, the head of the Italian mafia in New York City. And I guarantee you, as much as Jews were living in the same neighborhoods as black folks, they were living in the exact same neighborhoods as Italian folks, right? So when it came to black people, then they had to be confronted, you know, with fisticuffs and with weaponry. But when it was white people who they were confronting, who were being confronted by in the streets, then he doesn't make war with them, he makes peace with them, you know? And it wasn't just that they, you know, protested together, they played golf together. When Colombo was assassinated, Kahana was the only non-Italian allowed into the hospital room. So they were really tight. And, you know, that's because the, uh, you know, Italians were racialized as white in the American context, at least at that time, and because, uh, you know, the community generally voted for the right, whereas black community obviously is a black population and they generally voted left. So liberals, so that's, you know, this is, accounts for the disparity, okay? This wasn't about crime, it was about color. And at that time, because the mayor of New York City actually enjoyed a lot of support from the African-American community, he was very well loved, New York City was probably the only city that didn't burn, that didn't go up in flames after Martin Luther King was assassinated, because John Lindsay walked through the streets of Harlem and showed the people that he was of them, and that he also was horrified by the assassination. So it was like, you know, the only American city that didn't go, but because he enjoyed that, support, and because he supported black political aspirations, the Kahanists hated him. Everywhere Lindsay went, they would harass him and harangue him and make his life hell, and he would have to duck out the back door, you know, from speaking engagements, to the point where, you know, on the eve of his re-election, he actually had to bring Golda Meir, the former prime minister of Israel, at that time prime minister, he brings her into New York City to give her the keys to the city, hoping that that might save him, that that might uh, sway some of the Jewish voters to, that he had already lost because of these, this constant harassment from Kahana and the Jewish Defense League. So if up until now Kahana has been an asset of U.S. intelligence, now he becomes an asset of Israeli intelligence. Right? And this is Geula Cohen, and she's a lawmaker for in the Israeli parliament, and she comes to New York to meet with Kahana, and she tells him, why are you wasting time with the Schwarzes? All right, I probably don't have to translate that for German-speaking folk. It, obviously, this was meant disparagingly towards black folks, and, you know, what, what was she suggesting here? Instead of, you know, spending his energy fighting the black community, she had a different suggestion. The Soviets should be the target of his, of his efforts. And w why? What was the reason for this? So at that time, as you probably well know, this is uh, a poster campaign conducted by the USSR. I don't expect you to read Russian. I'll translate it for you. There is no God. Okay, what is meant by this? Um, well, the, the Soviet government was anti-religious. They were, you know, a secular government that wanted to convince their citizens to abandon religiosity. And here you have posters of, you know, explaining, oh, why, why do we need these pictures of Jesus? We can throw them away. After all, we've been to space and we can see there's no God there, right? And so this was an effort to modernize the society and push industrialization. And their campaign was across the board. It wasn't specifically to one religion. It was to all religions and, yeah, there's... You know, in, in their poster campaigns, they'd have a picture of a rabbi, but they would also have a picture of an imam and a priest. And if anything, they focused more on Christianity because most Russians were Christian, right? So their campaign was abandon religion altogether. But at that same time, you know, uh, the Soviet government was also opposed to Zionism. It opposed, you know, after, especially after the Six-Day War, 
you know, it opposed Israeli expansionism and supported Arab nationalism. And so, anyways, after 67, you see this resurgence in interest amongst Jews living in Soviet Russia to uh, reconnect to their Jewish roots and to practice Judaism. Now, in response to this, you know, Jewish folks around the world began to demonstrate in solidarity with them. So we have campaigns, equality now for Soviet Jews. Let these people practice their religion. Now, Kahana was nowhere to be found. Protest went on, and you know it didn't meet with any success. So eventually, protesters had to ramp up their demands and said, "Okay, well, let them live as Jews, or let them leave. You know, let them be practice their religion, or allow them emigrate." Kahana is still nowhere to be found. He's you know somewhere on the sidelines. In any case, things didn't improve for Soviet Jews, so they had to ramp up the solidarity protests. And then, at this point, people are just like, let our people go. We demand the right to emigrate and to move to another part of the world where we can be Jewish and you know, not be repressed by the state. So now, this dovetails with Kahana's ideology, with the third plank of his platform, which I call anti-diasporism. Anti-diaspora. And this is when he joins the movement. And then he's, you know, a strong campaigner demanding that the Soviet government allow Jewish people to emigrate. Uh, and the way that this manifested was not only with street demonstrations, but they would harass and harangue uh, any Soviet official that was stationed in the U.S., their wives, their children, anything associated with Soviets. And here's you know, an image from the streets of New York City. They actually have to be flanked by police officers in order to get from A to B, you know, really ramping up the rhetoric, red blood will flow, and you know, taking up arms, practicing, target, doing target practice to improve their... And, and, and actually shooting and bombing. And you know, for this, Kahana was heralded as like a leader of the struggle to free Soviet Jews. Now, what was the response of the mainstream Jewish community to, to Kahanism? So on the face of it, you know, the mainstream leadership, those who were you know, the accredited leaders of this, the, the struggle to free Soviet Jews, like Malcolm Hanlein, you know, said, oh, you know, Kahana, no, I, I would never work with Kahana. He's beyond the pale. That man's an extremist, you know, not for me. You know, that, that's, we don't have anything to do with him, and we don't communicate with him, you know. Turns out that was a complete whitewash. You know, 30 years later, we find out you know, Malcolm Honline has gone on to be uh, one of the, uh, the most powerful leaders in the Jewish community, the head of the Conference of Presidents, and come to find out that they were playing us the whole time, that this was you know, classic good cop, bad cop routine, where you know, uh, Honline was the face of the struggle, you know, and he said, oh, I got nothing to do with Kahana, but it, behind closed doors, they were coordinating strategies. Okay. Kahana would, you know, ramp up the struggle, and then Hanlan could say, oh, we got nothing to do with that, you know, that's, that's him, that's not us. Uh, but in fact, they were coordinating the whole time. The best way to understand that is um, Kahana's uncle, Isaac Trainin, and he actually headed the fundraising arm of the Philadelphia Jewish community. And what he said of Kahana and of the way that the mainstream Jewish leadership at that time worked with him, hand in glove, he said, that they would curse him in public, but give him money under the table. Of course, there were those who didn't even bother going under the table. There were just those who would give him money over the table, like Jackie Mason and others who actually organized promotional events you know, to raise funds for Kahana, straight up. So, now, talking about Geula Cohen, that Israeli lawmaker, Right? So she came to the United States to draw Kahana to the struggle. But it wasn't just that she put him onto the idea. It was also giving him the tools to make good on his threats. Now, when she came and met with Kahana, she wasn't alone. She came with another man, another Israeli parliamentarian. I don't know if any of you recognize the man she's standing with here. This is Yitzhak Shamir, who later went on to become Israel's prime minister. And you know, these two, you know, were both were colleagues from the Knesset, but they know each other decades earlier. I don't know if you'd followed, but 
back in the day, they were both members of the Lechi, one of the underground movements, the, uh, the Jewish terrorists who operated in British Palestine in the 1930s and 40s. They would you know, attack Palestinian targets and British targets in order to drive the British out of the country. And uh, so Shamir and Geula Cohen, they come to the U.S. and they meet with Kahana, you know, and start him on this path, but they also give him the tools to do so by introducing him to Amichai Paglin. And who is Paglin? And this is the man who was the chief bomb maker of the Irgun. Right? He was responsible for the bombing of the King David Hotel. You know, and all the people that died in it and other bombings, Paglin was the mastermind. And so now, Paglin is being brought to meet with Kahana to teach him bomb craft, to teach him and his henchmen how to build bombs. And then that information was then turned into, you know, instruction manuals. They then, the Jewish Defense League, they then, you know, printed these instruction manuals where they explained how to make a Molotov cocktail and incendiary time bombs and booby traps. And they passed this knowledge on to the rest of the Kahanist the followers of Kahana. So not only would they explain to them how to actually make the bombs, they would tell them who the targets should be. They would publish these lists of enemies of the Jews, so-called people they determined to be the enemies. And in these, uh, these texts, they would write, well, we cannot advocate any illegal activity. However, such groups have been the recipients of beatings and even a few bombings. Although we lose no sleep, we cannot tell people to do that it's illegal. So in other words, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know what to do. We can't explicitly say, go kill these people, but here's the instructions of how to make a bomb, and here's the people we think deserve to be bombed. You do with it what you will. So they would publish these, and, you know, they would act, people would, uh, you know, in their name, go out and try to assassinate these people, including the U.S. ambassador, to, uh, sorry, rather, the Soviet ambassador to the UN and the Soviet ambassador to the US. And they would you know, bomb cars and they would bomb boats and they would bomb bookstores and restaurants. And of course, uh, cultural events too. You know, why cultural events? You know, because at that time, it's the middle of the Cold War, there's hardly any cultural communication between Americans and Soviets. But you know, there were a few efforts to kind of bridge the gap between these peoples and kind of melt the ice. And so um, one of the most, one of the American promoters who worked hardest to bring Soviet cultural um, productions to the United States was this man, Saul Hirok, the American impresario, who happened to be Jewish. And because he did so, because he uh, broke you know, crossed the picket line that the Kahanists had established because he refused to, uh, to go along with their boycott, divest, sanctions program against Soviet Russia. So he was targeted as well. And so he's in his office in downtown New York City, and the office is bombed by the Kahanists. Uh, you know, of course, the office was gutted. Saul Hurok himself uh, was injured. He survived, but... One of his secretaries didn't. One of his secretaries was killed. Again, it's not necessarily relevant one way or another, but bears mentioning that that secretary happened to be Jewish as well. So they now have Jewish blood on their hands. And when it came to court, the men who were responsible for, these, you know, for this death Alan Dershowitz was the lawyer to defend them. And of course, he wrote about it in a book. He explained it all in the book he authored, The Best Defense. He writes there, Iris Konis, that's the name of the secretary, and other victims of my clients who have gone free because of my legal arguments. She was killed by someone I defended who I know for sure was guilty and went free. My client in that case told me and the world that he was guilty. Well, Today, that's back in the day, you know, nowadays, Dershowitz still remembers it well. He says, in these days and times, it was the first big case of my career and probably, in many ways, my favorite case. So, uh, 
Dershowitz has gone on to an illustrious career. You know, now he's taken that to, uh, he's written The Case for Israel. And of course, perhaps this is why Netanyahu a few years ago tapped him, nominated him to be Israel's ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, he didn't accept that dubious honor, but in any case, Kahana was mad popular. You know, people streamed to his side. Now, why? What was the secret of his success? How was he able to convince so many young Jews to join his movement? Well, um, at least one answer was offered by this man, Shalom Komei, who was the head of the American Jewish Committee, a uh, mainstream Jewish organization. And at that time, when Kahana uh, finally died, you know, he eulogized Kahana and saying, well, Mayor Kahana must always be remembered for the slogan, never again. And what is meant by this? By this he means, you know, that the Holocaust should never happen again. So invoking the Holocaust uh, is, you know, the right and privilege of Mayor Kahana, and for this he should be remembered. Now, well, how did he do it? Literally at every single event, no matter what the campaign was, never again. Jewish Defense League, never again, never again, never again. It didn't matter what the cause was or have had anything even remotely to do with the Holocaust or even approaching that level of horror. So, I mean, to ridiculous lengths. So here's Jesse Jackson, you know, the first African-American man to run for president of the U.S. No, Jackson is a black Nazi. Jackson is a Jew hater according to the Jewish Defense League. You know, Vanessa Redgrave, the actress, because she stood up to the Kahanists, no, Redgrave, Arafat, Hitler, there's no difference. No worries, take care, thanks for coming out. You know? I mean, it got so disgusting that even when the JDL would be fundraising, trying to raise money for its own activities, even then, they had the audacity to use this image, uh, this, you know, picture of a young boy uh, in Nazi Germany, being accosted by the Gestapo. And, and don't let it be in vain. Please give. Give as though people's lives depended on it. So, you know, guilting people into, oh, give us money because of the Holocaust is imminent. That's why you should give us money, because of the Holocaust. Really, um, such chutzpah. Of course, that same American Jewish committee, you know, when young Jews today, progressive Jews, are invoking that term never again, to talk about the detention centers into which the U.S. government is rounding asylum seekers, saying never again means never again to anyone, not just us. You know, then the American Jewish community is like, oh, how could they? This is gross to, you know, usage of the term, and they shouldn't be using it, and how dare they use it? Okay, you know, for Kahana, it's fine. If you're right-wing and using it to ramp up fear amongst Jews, you know, to close ranks within the community, then it's all good. But when left-wing use it, to actually demand an end to concentration camps on U.S. soil, then it's a problem. Of course, no big shock from the AJC when there were actual Nazis on the streets of America. What did they do? How did they respond when, you know, here's George Washington. There used to be actual Nazis, and well, now they're coming back. But, but back when, you know, the, the first round, when Nazis were actually marching in the streets, and they actually had enough support to fill Madison Square Gardens in New York City. This is a Nazi rally, right? And, and at that time, the head of the American Jewish Committee wrote to the owner of Madison Square Gardens, no, 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 don't shut it down. Give them their say. Allow them to, you know, free speech and all. You know, they should have a platform as well. So really, with, with your checkered history, I, I really think that the AJC should uh, sit this one out when it comes to responding to Nazi threats and, and who has the right to invoke the memory of never again. But in any case, you know, it is fair to, to say that the Kahanists did stand up to real live Nazis, you know. Uh, it wasn't just in, in, uh, in word, but also in deeds. So they would actually send bombs to the heads of the U.S. Nazi party, you know. They didn't always explode, but they would send them. And uh, not, not only would they, you know, confront the... The, the, the leaders of the Nazi party. But, you know, think of at that time, we actually have Nazis uh, organizing marches in the streets of the, of the United States. This is uh, at that time, 
a guy who, who organized a white power rally, and of course you need to fill out a form, submit it to Philadelphia City Hall in order to get a permit, right? So, so he writes there, you know, for the, what's the reason for the, for the demo, for the demonstration? Well, it's going to be a white power rally to show to white masses the unity of the white race and that N-word and Jews are cowards. And uh, you know, wh what signs are you going to have at the demonstration? Oh, we're going to have signs that say, gas, commie, Jews, and Hitler was right. So he submits the paperwork, and of course, in response, the, the Jewish Defense League, you know, it's like, all right, well, we're going to get this guy. We're going to show him what's what. We're going to confront them in the streets of Philadelphia. We're not going to allow this to pass. Sounds good, right? Until you find that the head of the Jewish Defense League in Philadelphia was the same guy who organized the Nazi rally, Mordechai Levy. He just did it under another name, under a pseudonym, but he actually organized that Nazi rally. Why would he do that? Why would the head of the Jewish Defense League organize a white supremacist rally. Well, again, as I've been explaining to you, it's about that anti-diasporism that is the third plank of the Kahana's platform. Meaning, well, in Kahana's own words, you know, he said, we want all of our kids to go to Israel. There is no future for the Jews in America. There's only one thing that will bring Jews over to Israel in any large scale from any Western country, anti-Semitism. And of course, if there's not enough of it, then he would have to create it. So that's Kahana and the Nazis. So, okay, at this point, you know, he's got such a, a record, you know, he's already, you know, his minions have already been caught left and right, running guns, shooting, bombing, and then Kahana himself gets arrested, and they've got him dead to rights. They have him, uh, you know, writing letters to his henchmen saying straight up, I suggest an immediate kidnapping or shooting of a Soviet diplomat. If we can't get someone to shoot a Russian diplomat, anyone, we are Jewish pigs. So the judge gives him two options. Basically, at this point, you can either go to jail or go to Israel. You decide. And you know, <laughs> deciding he doesn't want to go to jail, he decides, okay, this is the moment, he's now going to move to Israel, and, and when he does, remember, you know, I talked about the different camps, the four camps, the four different modes of Jewish political thought, you know, so there are the two camps from which Kahana drew inspiration, the nationalists and the religious, but of course, you know, as I also explained, the Jewish community is diverse and also has left-wing camps. You know, there's also the liberals and the socialists. And probably, like, pretty much any community looks something like a bell curve, I imagine. Um, you know, mostly somewhere in the middle, and then, of course, there's also on the edges, and, and that makes up the diversity of political thought. Now, once Kahana comes into the mix, what he does is just the invention of a fifth camp on the far right, and its you know, legitimization means that it shifts the Overton window. So now, what, how do we measure the effects of Kahanism in North America? Now, the center of the Jewish community is firmly in the nationalist camp, firmly in the Zionist camp. Okay, that's the effect of Kahanism in the US. But of course, once Kahana moves to Israel, he's working with a whole different set because, you know, Israel is the nationalist project, right? So it only stands to reason that many of the Jew, most of the Jews who move there are of the nationalist variety, right? So when he gets to Israel, this is, you know, what he encounters, a community that is mostly nationalist, as I explained earlier. And with the second largest camp being the religious camp. And so if Kahana was popular in the streets of, of the United States, he was much more popular in Israel. Now, when he gets there, you know, the religious elite and the political leaders of the time, they all want to bring him into the fold. They recognize his potential, but he decides to go it alone. He decides he's going to run in his own right, start his own political party, and he does so and he makes it into the Knesset. In the Knesset, he starts proposing bills. You know, he submits legislation, and he tables it, and so this is when I say that he launches the fourth plank of the Kahanist platform. I call it anti-love, 
And what I mean by that, here's a sample of a poster that he you know, popularized. And uh, again, I'll translate. I don't expect you to read Hebrew. And this is in English. Jewesses, don't date Arabs or other Gentiles. And of course, this, 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 he actually you know, put it into the form of a bill. And here's the exact text. So you can't say I'm quoting it out of context. Here's the exact text of the bill that Kahana proposed. Jews and Jewesses are forbidden to marry non-Jews, whether in Israel or abroad. Partners in a mixed marriage, which has already been performed, will be compelled to separate immediately. Jews and Jewesses are forbidden to have full or partial sexual relations of any sort with non-Jews. The transgressor of the section shall be punished with two years imprisonment. A non-Jew who seduces a Jew to have sexual relations shall be punished with three years imprisonment. The claim that the non-Jew did not know that his partner was a Jew does not exempt him from punishment. And the education ministry will prepare curriculum for primary and secondary schools against intermarriage. Okay, now that's obviously uh, Kana's efforts to you know, create total racial separation. But that's not enough for him. You know, he's got to go to the next level, and he wants expulsion, right? And so that's, this is now the fifth plank of his platform, which I call anti-Gentile. And so here's the text of the next bill that he proposed to the Knesset. Of course, it's, uh, we already see the seeds of it in his manifesto, one of many books he wrote, They Must Go. There's not a lot of room for interpretation here, not too subtle. A point, straight up, ethnic cleansing is his goal. And here's the text again, so you can't say I quoted it out of, out of context. Only a member of the Jewish people may be a citizen of the state of Israel. The National Insurance Institute, the Social Security, only Jews will be able to benefit from its payments. A commission will be established to investigate the various religions to determine which of them are idol worship. Okay? A non-Jew who wishes to dwell in the land of Israel will have to assume the status of resident alien. What does that mean? The government shall determine the maximal number of resident aliens who may be settled in the land of Israel. So, you know, the, don't get your hopes up, you know, that we, let's see if you make the cut. You know, we're going to decide, if you're not Jewish, whether you live in the land or not, you know, we're going to have, we're gonna have to... Uh, Figure out if, you, if you're worthy of it. A resident alien may not live within the municipal boundaries of the city of Jerusalem. So just to start off, ethnically cleanse the capital city altogether. A resident alien may not be appointed to any position of authority and will not be able to vote. So complete disenfranchisement for Palestinian citizens of Israel and anyone else who's not Jewish. Every resident alien will also assume the obligations of taxes and slavery as defined by Jewish law. Okay, you were shocked when I talked of slavery earlier. Here's the roots of it. Okay, a commission shall determine the compensation to each non-Jew who prefers to voluntarily leave Israel. So here's the real goal. This is what he's driving at, right? Make it so horrific so that, you know, you're just like, God, I, I can't take it anymore. Better to uh, live on my feet somewhere else in the world than, you know, to be oppressed so in my homeland. So this is the idea to kick Palestinian people out of the country by making life so sufferable for them, so insufferable. So, of course, any violation by a resident alien of one of his obligations will bring immediate expulsion from Israel. So really, turn the screws in. And at this point, you know, when he's proposing these racist bills, at that point, Israel's in a different place than it is today. So back in the mid-80s, when he was proposing these bills, even the Likud party, even the ruling Likud party, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu's party, the right-wing party, even they were disgusted by this and found that this was you know, beyond the pale racist. And so you have, at that time, a Likud lawmaker who wasn't known for his liberalism in other contexts, but even he, Michael Eitan, he stood in the Knesset, and he just broke it down point by point. He said, Kahana is really, the, what he's proposing isn't any different from Hitler. The Nuremberg laws are almost identical 
to what Kahana's platform entails, point for point. It just went down point for point. Kahana wants this, this is what Hitler did. Kahana's, this is what he's striving for, Hitler passed this law, point by point. This is in the Knesset, okay? This isn't some radical anti-Zionist. This is the right wing of the Israeli parliament explaining this. And, I mean, Kahana didn't do himself any favors when he even said in, in an interview in Playboy magazine, he was asked, well, so then the only difference between you and, say, the Nazi party is that they're wrong and you're right? Kahana's response was, well, I can't put it any better than that. In any case, this is to show you how far gone he was that at that point, even the right wing in Israel found him disgustingly racist. And, I mean, this is now, you know, when Kahana brings out the sixth plank of his platform, which I call anti-secular. And, uh, you know, here's a couple quotes to get a sense of his, his vision for, for Israel. Democracy and Western humanistic values are foreign implants meaningless to authentic Judaism. Anyone who declares that any verse in the Bible isn't true is racist and should be subject to three years in prison. So he wants, as I said, a total Torah state, a complete theocracy. This is what he's striving for. Uh, and, and the way that that manifested, um, amongst other ways, was in efforts to, well, here again, a, a, a poster in Hebrew, but I'll translate it to English for your benefit, to remove the foreigners from the Temple Mount. What, what is meant by this? Of course, foreigners, he's talking about the indigenous Palestinians. And uh, by the Temple Mount, he's talking about Haram al-Sharif, which is like the holy esplanade in the center of the old city of Jerusalem, uh, where you have these mosques, right? Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. And what he wants to do is to turn it into a temple, a Jewish temple, come abattoir. Not just a place of prayer, but a place where on Jewish holidays they will sacrifice over 10,000 animals, over 10,000 animals. This is what he wants to turn that area into, to demolish the mosques, you know, which by any you know, standard, probably talking about the most beautiful structures in the entire country. Uh, of course, holy to Muslims all over the world. And you know, for Palestinian people, a potent symbol of Palestinian nationalism. And, Kahana wants to crush it, to demolish them and build a Jewish temple on their ruins. So, you know, all along Kahana had held this in regard, you know, this is, this is his objective. Um, and he preached for this, but today, if once this was considered, oh, this is beyond the pale, this is crazy, this is so far from the mainstream of Israeli society, today it's firmly in the mainstream of Israeli society. You'd be surprised. This is the chief rabbi of the Templar movement in Israel. And uh, this guy, he is a straight Kahanist. When Kahana was running for the Knesset, this guy was his number two. And now he's the, head, he's the chief rabbi of the Templar movement. This is Israel Ariel, the man who, uh, in the early 80s, he actually was arrested by Israeli police and charged with sedition for planning with other Kahanists, Israeli soldiers, to dig, to tunnel under the Dome of the Rock in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, to, to dig and to you know, come up and then take over and turn it into a Jewish settlement. That was his plan. So he was arrested. And then just a few years later, the Israeli Minister of Religious Affairs is already granting Israel Ariel a mandate to, to start his temple institute to teach Israeli students school children about the glory of Jewish temples past and to yearn for new Jewish temples in the future. This is, again, my tax money. From two different ministries, the culture ministry and the education ministry, funding this man to try to teach Israeli youth to want to build these temples instead of the mosques that exist there currently. And again, this isn't fringe. Here is Israel Ariel getting the famed Jerusalem Prize from the mayor of Jerusalem at that time, Nir Barakat. Okay? Here is Israel Ariel in the Knesset. I took this photo in the Knesset, you know, receiving a standing ovation from members of Knesset and from ministers. You know. So this is the level of mainstreaming of the... You know, when we're talking about Israel Ariel, where it's not just that he wants to ethnically cleanse 
Israel and its so-called internationally recognized borders and boundaries. No, 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 that's not enough for him. And it's not even enough to ethnically cleanse the country uh, in its maximal borders of greater Israel, you know, with the Egyptian Sinai and the Golan Heights and the West Bank and the East Bank. And No, no, no. He goes further. He actually wants it all. He wants, Lebanon, he wants the entire Middle East. I actually recorded him saying this. We want... We will conquer Iraq, Turkey. We will get to Iran too. The mosques and the Christian spires and their crosses come down. If not, you kill all of their males by sword. You only leave the woman. Chief rabbi of the Templar movement, paid by my tax money. Uh, And he wasn't the only Kahanist to try to take down the mosques on the Temple Mount. We're also talking about U.L. Lerner, another American-born Kahanist who three times tried to blow up the Dome of the Rock. There was, uh, of, course he, 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 of course, as soon as he would get out of jail, he would go right back there and, and give tours of the Temple Mount, guided tours, you know. This is how he spent his, his, uh, his senior years. There was Alan Goodman who actually succeeded. He, he made it to the Temple Mount with an army-issued uh, rifle and killed two Palestinians there shooting up the, the, the Dome of the Rock. And, uh, you know, when he was finally released, you know, he, several Israeli presidents actually uh, reduced his sentence. So he got out after 15 years. When he got out, he showed no contrition whatsoever. He said, what I did was politically correct to fight for a Jewish nation. But it wasn't only them. There was also Baruch Ben Yosef. And he, maybe more than anyone else, shows the level of impunity enjoyed by the Kahanist movement in Israel. So who is this man? Baruch Ben Yosef. In 1985, Baruch Ben Yosef, working with two other American-born Kahanists, Robert Manning and Keith Fuchs, they, according to the FBI, they assassinated this man, Alex Odeh. Now, who is Alex Odeh? A Palestinian, born in the West Bank, and at that time, there was no Palestinian university. To speak. He was only a couple kilometers away from uh, Birzeit, but Birzeit wasn't a university then. So he had to go to Cairo to do his BA, and then he went to America to do his master's, and then he decided to stay there, immigrated, uh, got his citizenship, and was one of the first recruits of the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. What is this? Um, think, at that time, uh, probably not so different from the times we're living in. But at that time, there was like a lot of racism towards Arab folks. In in the United States, the idea of Arab people was, you know, generally negative. At least the media images were. And these were the ideas that, you know, kids were growing up on, whether it was with art or cartoons or Hollywood movies. There were generally negative images that people were being subjected to. And so, you know, groups like the ADC, their goal was to change that, you know, to put out positive images of Arab people. And also, it should be said, and we're talking about the mid-80s, this is a time that's really the first efforts by Arab Americans to organize politically. So what we see is at that time in 1985, the ADC taking out full-page ads in the Washington Post and other newspapers saying, you know, well, maybe we shouldn't be spending all this money and sending billions of dollars every year to the Israeli military. Maybe we ought to be spending some of that money on our own youth, you know, on our senior citizens. And because of this, because really for the first time, this is, you know, an effort to change the narrative, to challenge the dominance that the Zionist narrative had enjoyed in in Washington, D.C. And so because of this, the, the ADC was perceived as a threat. And that's why... Alex Ode had to be killed, I guess. That's why the Kahanists killed him. They started off by, you know, th- threatening him, and they'd call him on the regular and threaten him. And I found this evidence in their own files of, of, of it. But, but on October 11th, 1985, later that day, he actually was supposed to speak at a local synagogue. He was doing intersectional work before we even had that name for it uh, because he really believed in our safety is in solidarity, working with other communities, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. But that day, he walks into his office, and it exploded. Of course, this was 
you know, highly traumatic for his community and for his family, uh, but for the Jewish Defense League, uh, the national chair at that time, Irv Rubin, said, well, he got exactly what he deserved. So, this is how, in America, they took the life of a Palestinian man. But, you know, it's not only in America where they're operative. You know, now the Qantas movement is in Israel, and its record in Israel is horrific. You know, they have the, uh, uh, the status of having, you know, the biggest body count on their hands, you know, in their history. This is Hebron, right? This is the largest Palestinian population center in the West Bank. And this is, uh, we're looking at the Ibrahimi Mosque, or the Cave of the Patriarchs. This is a site that's holy to Jews and Muslims. And in 1994, uh, a Kahanis walks in to the mosque and he just sprays everyone with bullets. It's the Friday of Ramadan, and so it was full up with Palestinian men and boys, and he killed 29. And you know, injured over a hundred. And, and the murderer was this man, Baruch Goldstein, another American-born follower of Mir Kahana. He had even run for Knesset on Kahana's party, for Kahana's party. Now, at this point, the Israeli government understands belatedly, but finally begins to understand what it's dealing with. At that point, Rabin is in power, and he realizes we're talking about a terrorist group, and every sense of the word. And as such, they need to be treated as terrorist groups are treated. And so, finally, the Israeli government rounds up the leaders of the Kahana movement, rounds them up into jail, and puts them in administrative detention. I don't know if people here are familiar with that term. Uh, it's like a draconian, you know, some, it's kind of a holdover from British colonialism when you would arrest people on suspicion of terrorism. You don't need to show any evidence, at least not to them. You just put them behind bars and they can be there for months at a time and there's no recourse. They don't have, it's not without any habeas corpus or any of those uh, regulations. So finally, in 1994, they round up the leadership of the Kahanists. Now, in the Knesset, the Likud is outraged. Here's Limor Livnat and she's, you know, in a huff and a puff, how dare you? What are you doing? How can you arrest these people and put them behind bars without any, you know, recourse? And, uh, well, Israel's police minister at that time, Arabin's police minister, Moshe Shacha, eh, calm down, Limo. I mean, you're looking at me like we're doing something wrong here. After all, it was a Likud government that used administrative detention for the first time against Jewish Israeli citizens. When was that? in 1980, against Rabbi Kahana, against Rabbi Baruch Ben Yosef Green, against that same Baruch Ben Yosef. What does this mean? I'm talking about the assassin of Alex Aude, who then, immediately after the murder, fled right back to Israel and has been living in Israel ever since that time. Where is he? Where is he? Why isn't he sent back to the U.S. to serve time, to stand, for you know, to stand trial for the murder of Alex Aude? Well, if, if the Israeli government claims they don't know where he is, I'll tell you where he is. He's in Israel's jails. Twice. He actually holds the record. He is the Israeli Jew who has sat in administrative detention more than any other citizen in the history of the state. So now you're going to tell me you don't know where he is? You had him in your jail. You were holding him there. Uh, it, it gets worse, if you can imagine this. So that's 94. Three years later, December 97, the Mordiv she's now cut her hair short, and she's now Minister of Communications. So she comes to the USA, and she visits this man. You remember him? I don't know if this is going to be familiar to some of y'all. This is Jonathan Pollard. Very brief tangent, but Pollard was an American Jew who worked in U.S. naval intelligence and spied for Israel on the U.S. government, uh, passed information to Israel, and so eventually he was caught, sentenced to jail. But, you know, to the Israeli right, he's a hero. And so, you know, I guess Limo Livnat is a... Uh, you know, fights for the rights of Jewish prisoners. And so she comes to the U.S. and she brings, she meets with Pollard and she brings with her a letter from Netanyahu, a letter of support. And Netanyahu writes to Pollard saying, I sincerely hope that our continued efforts on your behalf will bear fruit. Okay, that's the Pollard incident. I'm going to put a point on that and come back to it in a sec. So three weeks later, Netanyahu himself comes to the U.S. This is now January 1998. Netanyahu is now prime minister. 
okay? And he comes to the U.S. for talks with the White House. So he's in Washington, D.C., and he's at the National Press Club giving a press conference. And now he's asked about this. What about the murder of Alex O'Day? I mean, according to the FBI, these are the killers. They fled to Israel. What are you doing about it? You know, why isn't there any justice? And so Netanyahu says, well, you know, um, yeah, I, I know about the case of Alex O'Day, but didn't we send you the murderer already? Didn't we send you Robert Manning? We extradited him back to the U.S. But Israel extradited him for a different murder, a murder that he'd committed years previous that had nothing to do with the, you know, uh, it was just a murder for hire. It was a murder for money. And he, in fact, is sitting in an American jail till this day. But he never, sat tri he never stood trial for the murder of Alex O'Day. And besides the fact, there's two others. The questioner then goes on, presses him, says, you know, okay, so here's Manning today, still in jail, but then the questioner asks him, well, Keith Fuchs and Andy Green are apparently still in Kiryat Arba. That's the, you know, the Kahanist uh, enclave outside of Hebron. And uh, the Justice Department has not received full cooperation at all from the Israeli government on this matter. What's Netanyahu's response? Incidentally, you can go online afterwards and watch the video on C-SPAN to verify it for yourself. I'm not just making it up. Netanyahu's response is, oh, I assure you that our policy is to cooperate fully with the murderers. Now, okay, I can already hear someone in the audience must be saying, no, Bichyad, come on, David, really? This is obviously just a slip of the tongue. I mean, it's easy for anyone who, you know, to make a mistake and to just, you know, slip up and say the wrong thing. And if, admittedly, he responded, you know, right afterwards, he followed this up with boilerplate, you know, Oh, of course, we don't discriminate against Jews or Arabs. We arrest everyone who's going. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, fair enough. Um, but in evaluating whether or not this was some kind of Freudian slip, we need only look a few months into the future. So this press conference is in January 98. November 98, Netanyahu is in court. Why? He's now being sued by that same Jonathan Pollard. Okay, Netanyahu sent him a letter of support, but that's not enough. He's still rotting away in a U.S. jail. He's pissed. You know, here I am sitting in a U.S. jail and I could be here for the rest of my life. When's Netanyahu going to actually stand up and claim me as an Israeli agent? And maybe in that way, perhaps I could be repatriated to Israel. And this is what he wants. And so he's now demanding, he's now suing Netanyahu in Israeli court, demanding that, you know, and this case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. So now Netanyahu is in the Supreme Court defending himself from a lawsuit from Jonathan Pollard. And who do you think the lawyer was? Yeah, people generally uh, suspected Alan Dershowitz would have been the lawyer, but no, actually, it was this man. That same Baruch Ben Yosef. He's now reinvented himself. He went to law school, got his law degree, and he's now suing Netanyahu, filing suit against him in an Israeli court, and it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. Ten months earlier, Netanyahu was like, oh, I have no idea where these guys are. Oh, the assassins of Alex Ode. Who knows where they could be anywhere? No idea where they might be. They're suing you in court. You really expect me to believe you don't know where he is? He's the person standing in front of you in court. That's where he is. And Netanyahu just covers for him and expects us all to believe that he has no idea. This is the level of impunity that the Kahanist movement operates in to the highest levels of power. Are you starting to understand this? So, Baruch Ben Yosef, of course, today, he continues uh, to be, uh, he's argued at this point dozens of times in front of Israel's Supreme Court. Um, he's sued not just Netanyahu, he's sued several Israeli prime ministers and more ministers, but, of course, continuing to return to the Dome of the Rock that he tried to blow up back in 1980, on the regular, but remember, I said there were two who are still in Israel, and the other one is Keith Fuchs. Well, he's still living in Israel. He's still showing up at the Dome of the Rock whenever he can. He's now changed his name to Israel Fuchs. But um, in some ways, the level of impunity he's enjoyed uh, are even more disgusting than those enjoyed by Baruch Ben Yosef. So in recent years, Fuchs actually got together with Four other men, also uh, members of a Kahanist front group, Komemiut, 
And they established an NGO called Meshilut, of course, with money from Netanyahu's bagman. This is Ken Abramovitz, the head of Likud USA, so the biggest funder of Netanyahu's Likud party. Right? So the funder of the Likud party funds Israel Fuchs, and together they form Meshilut, this NGO that is today authoring legislation in the Israeli Knesset, writing the rules and having members of Knesset pass them becoming law. And here is Israel Fuchs sitting in a meeting of the Israeli Knesset committee. That's the level of impunity. So, you know, the words, the quotes that I've attributed to Kahana, I mean, they're gross in and of themselves, but that was, you know, what he said. That's the laundered uh, English that he used when he was in the legislature. Of course, on the street, it just, it's as gross as you can get, you know, saying, I want to remove the Arabs from Israel because I do not want to kill them every week. So when I'm prime minister, no Arab will be hurt by Jewish terrorism because there won't be an Arab left in Israel. Saying, they'll bow to me, lick my feet, and I'll be merciful and will allow them to leave. Whoever does not leave will be slaughtered. Well, with this level of uh, incitement to genocide, it's no small wonder that in 1990, Kahana himself was assassinated on the streets of New York City um, by a group of men who later would form Al-Qaeda. This is actually the first uh, you know, terrorist attack of the people that became Al-Qaeda. Um, and once Kahana dies, you know, uh, the chief rabbi of Israel, Mordechai Eliyahu, actually eulogizes him at his funeral. His funeral is attended by hundreds of thousands. It's like one of the biggest funerals in the history of the country. And the way that we can measure the success of the Kahana movement is by looking at the city of Hebron. So this is the, 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 the shuk, right? the suk, the marketplace in Hebron. This is before 1984. And you can see it's hustling and bustling and people are purchasing their wares. And then Ever since the massacre, the Cave of the Patriarchs, this is what it looks like now. It's a ghost town. So instead of kicking out the Kahanists, the government expelled the Palestinian people from the markets. And this is the level of influence that the Kahanists have in Israel. Of course, the year after that massacre, Rabin himself was assassinated. Incidentally, five years to the day after Kahana was assassinated. Was it a coincidence or did his murderer intend to, to, to send a message here? In any case, once Rabin is assassinated, soon after Netanyahu comes to power. And what does Netanyahu do once he's in power? He appoints Kahanists to the government. He actually installs in his government former followers of Kahana. Of course, they've now you know, realized that they can achieve more if they uh, you know, take off the Kahanist garb and put on a suit. And so these men, uh, who were once followers of Mayor Kahana, now they've been whitewashed. I don't know if you recognize them from their youth. You may recognize them, however, in their modern incarnation. Here's the ministers Tzachi Hanegbi and Avigdor Lieberman. So now, you know, you know, the followers of Kahana are actually in the halls of power, but, uh, you know, even if they don't now espouse, you know, support for Kahana, Kahana has, of course, got his own supporters, like Bensi Gopstein, and he is still funded by Netanyahu's bagmen. So here's Simon Fallick, all right? This is the number one supporter of Lehava, that's the Kahanist anti-miscegenation gang that roams through Israeli cities trying to break up, harass and harangue mixed couples, you know, who are uh, romantic relationships between Jews and non-Jews. They try to stamp them out. So this anti-miscegenation gang is funded by Simon Fallick. Who's Simon Fallick? The top funder of Netanyahu's political campaigns. When Netanyahu runs for office within the Likud party, his top funder is Simon Fallick, that same Simon Fallick who's the top funder of the Kahanist movement. Are you starting to understand the connection between Likud and Kahana? This is how deep it runs. Gopstein asked straight up, are you in favor of burning churches in the land of Israel, yes or no? He just says straight up, you have to burn. Yes, of course, simply yes. Why are you even asking? You have any doubt? 
And of course, it's not only words. You know, the followers of the Kahanists put these words into practice. And they burn churches. And they burn schools. This is, you know, one of the only schools. You know, 99% of schools in Israel are segregated by race or religion. The one of the only schools in which Jews and Palestinians actually study together in Hebrew and Arabic, they target it because, you know, they're trying to separate. So they're trying to separate the races and they'll burn the schools if they have to. And this is their legacy. This is Israel today. So yes, it's true that in 1988, Israel's Supreme Court did actually decide that Kahana's party was too racist by Israeli standards and uh, you know, kicked them out of the Knesset and ruled that they could no longer run for the Israeli parliament. That's true, that did occur in 1988. But here we are, 30 years later, and now the Supreme, that same Supreme Court rules that the Kahanist party, the party of Kahanist followers, is eligible to run for the Knesset. And they do. And they've fused with the Jewish Home Party, thanks to Netanyahu's efforts. He urged them to do so, and they did. And whether they get into the Knesset or they don't get into Knesset, whether they have enough votes to do so, that's not the major issue. As Itamar Ben-Gvir said himself, it could be that we will be in the next Knesset or that we won't be in the Knesset. That's one question. But when we move the whole system to the right, it's not just one member of Knesset, it's the whole government that moves. After all, it's not only the Kahanist party that has Kahanists. My Golan, who they've been cultivating for years, who has led efforts to ethnically cleanse Tel Aviv of African refugees, all along, all these years, she's been the, the, the face of Kahanism. And now, she joined the Likud party. Netanyahu himself tapped her to be the youth representative. She, he made her a member of Knesset for the ruling Likud party. So now we have Kahanists, not only in the Kahanist party, but in the ruling Likud party itself. This is why I say that we've now entered Messiah mode. Generally, at the end of my presentations, I say something funny or uplifting at the end. But uh, unfortunately... I don't have anything uplifting to say. This is our new reality. We're in Messiah mode, and we need to start grappling with that new reality. And that's why I've come here to explain this to you. And now we can start the conversation about what to do about that. Thank you for coming here today.